Um, hello and welcome to our first inaugural webinar on public health. When we were thinking at the department about starting this series of webinars, the main question was, should we add another webinar to the abundance of plenty of other online events? Uh, but we felt that there is always a need for sharing new interesting thoughts and experiences. COVID pandemic changed our lives. Uh, we had to quickly to transform and accept new technology for education and work. Uh, maybe we all needed this lesson to reassess priorities and values in our life, to bring people and families closer to each other, at the same time to value social distancing. Uh, my name is Michael Grivna and I'm professor and director of Institute of Public Health at the College of Medicine and Health Sciences, uh, United Arab Emirates University. This starting series of webinars is part of the global campaign, This is Public Health. We are also very proud to be affiliated with ASFER, this Association of Schools of Public Health in European region. We will try to organize our webinars monthly on every third Wednesday with the aim of bringing interesting speakers in order to highlight different important public health issues. In this webinar, you will be able to ask questions. Uh, you can do so by clicking on the QA option in the middle of bottom of, of your screen. Uh, you are welcome to submit your questions during the presentation and uh, our speakers uh, will respond. Uh, we'll also allow you, depending on time, uh, to open your mic and ask questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, I'm really honored that our invitation for our first inaugural webinar was accepted by two distinguished gentlemen, Dr. Luis Hugo Francescuti and Dr. Robert Barrett. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Luis Francescuti is uh, emergency and preventive medicine physician. Uh, he's international speaker. He was trained in preventive medicine at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, USA, and is past president of the Canadian Medical Association and past president of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. He spent nearly three decades advocating one message, live smart. He's regarded as one of Canada's leading medical visionaries. Dr. Robert Barrett has spent much of his life studying behavior, group dynamics, and organizational structure. He's pilot. His primary focus is on why we do the things we do and how individuals and teams can reach top performance. He has traveled to rural Nigeria to interview recruiters and leaders of death squads on how they indoctrinate fighters. He helped build Canada's first ever patient safety officer program for Canadian hospitals, lectured on intercultural negotiation for senior Canadian forces officers deployed uh, by, uh, to Afghanistan, uh, and was a lead researcher or a unique program uh, designated to investigate ways to mitigate astronaut crew <laughs> space for future Mars missions. So welcome to our webinar and uh, Luis and Robert, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Great, well, thank you very much for the uh, honor of uh, being your inaugural speakers. Uh, we're gonna try and make absolutely sure that we engage with the audience as much as is possible via Zoom. Um, any questions you send and any questions to the polls we put to you are anonymous. And uh, hopefully we will have time at the end uh, to have a uh, fulsome discussion. Now, Robert and I have uh, worked together for many, many years. And uh, the genesis of our presentation started when we were doing some safety talks many years ago. And uh, people kept coming up after and saying, uh, have uh, the two of you written a book about all this stuff? And uh, so after two or three years of hard work, we actually did write a book called Hardwired, How Our Instincts to Be Healthy Are Making Us Sick. And we want to share some of those findings with you today. We're going to do it in little sections. Um, it's obvious that we can't cover all the material uh, that we would like to, but at least what we'd like to do is whet your appetite and get you interested in 
why things are the way they are. As was mentioned at the beginning, COVID has really made us realize uh, the inequities that exist within our society and the consequences of those inequities as well. Um, if I was to summarize the book in one word, it's basically that humans in the 21st century are running on outdated software. So in other words, the software that has kept us alive for millions of years um, is having trouble coping in the 21st century. And we're seeing the consequences of that um, in our emergency departments. As an emergency physician, I can tell you that on a daily basis, I see the failure of humans being able to cope with uh, 21st century life. Uh, we see it in our young people and uh, the stresses that they're under and the direct impact of social media and how social media is having um, primarily a deleterious effect on our youth. And so what we need to do is start identifying worldwide how we can reset or put some patches in so that we can survive in the 21st century. It's not that we're not spending enough money. We're spending more than enough money on so-called healthcare. In the United States, for example, the Institutes of Medicine showed us that 35% of all dollars spent in the United States are totally wasted. And so for you know, an annual budget that's in the trillions of dollars, uh, that's an enormous amount of money that could be redirected to making a difference at the end of the day. So what we would like to achieve at the end of this presentation is to just get you to say, hmm, I never thought about that, or that makes sense, or wow, if that's true, then how we're gonna reorient our policymakers and our decision makers uh, to start making the right decisions so that everyone has access to good health. Um, I think it's I think it's going to be a, a fast paced presentation. We're going to be going back and forth, and we're going to start off with a, a simple poll to find out where our viewers are signing in from. So, um, Ismail, if you could put up the poll, uh, this takes one second. You just get your mouse, go over the region that you're joining us from. I'll do it as well, and then just hit submit on the bottom, uh, and then we'll get you those results in probably two or three minutes. And uh, just to share with you where people are joining us from. So I'd like to turn it over to Robert to tell us a little bit about um, how we came up with this idea, these thoughts, the book, and uh, what we're going to try and get across, especially in terms of what you can do to change your life and the life of others around you. Robert, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having us on. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for having us. Um, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, Louis provided us a great introduction uh, to the general theme of the book, and I thought I would just take a moment just to describe uh, maybe some of the the thirty second theory that uh, that helps inform the book. So when Louis and I were asking the same question, you know, why do we do the things we do? Louis, as an ER physician, of course, sees the the serious medical consequences of of some of these uh, behaviors that, that didn't go so well and, and led to injury or worse. And from my world in the social science realm, I started looking at the same question, but uh, more from a you know, psychological, sociological, and partly anthropological view as well of why do we do the things that we do. And it was only when we were able to really put these two worlds together and combine these lenses one over top of another that we're really able to see that friction point uh, between our social world and the, the rapid changes that we're seeing in the social world and also what is happening in terms of our health consequences. So we have some, some quite uh, significant uh, health consequences that are happening just in the last uh, generation or so, plus uh, what could probably be described as the most rapid social change that we've ever experienced as well in, that, in terms of social change, communication, technology. So we looked at this and said, okay, well, is this something that we you know, learn um, after we're born? Are we born with, with certain traits that are uh, inseparable from us? So this gets into the, you know, the great debate about whether you know, we're born as a blank slate, uh, you know, the tabula rasa where, we, where our culture essentially fills in the blanks and then also you know, helps us be who we are or whether we're born with certain uh, heritable traits uh, that have evolved with us that then inform our behavior. So we, in the book, we do have evidence of, of both 
but the book does lean towards hardwiring. And the evidence of both would be, for example, um, children who are born with certain evolutionary hardwiring, but then because they're exposed to maybe trauma or stress, uh, that starts to change um, their patterns for the rest of their life as well. So really it's, it's we have this hardwiring, but it's, it's almost a lack of respect for the hardwiring that really gets us into trouble. And I think that's where the main focus of the, of the book is as well. I wanna just take a moment to go over the book, uh, just some of the general ideas just to give you a, that 40,000 foot uh, view as to, as to what, uh, uh, what it's all about. So we start off with the idea that uh, um, hospitals are a place that you really don't want to be around if you can avoid it. Of course, we have to go to hospitals sometimes, but the reason we don't wanna be around it is because of the preventable error that we see in hospitals. So we have some fascinating statistics, for example, that one in four uh, individuals going into a hospital will experience a preventable medical error. And preventable me medical errors now kill more people uh, the United, in the United States and in Canada and other parts of the world than car crashes or strokes. So that's, a, that's where we start the, the conversation from. We talk about why do we crave bad things. Um, we looked at a uh, fascinating statistic that if you look at the, the longevity trends over the last thousand years, um, the wealthy nations that should be experiencing a year-over-year -year positive trend um, had a big dip in the mid 1990s. And if we look at the United States, they are slowly starting to recover from that dip in longevity, but still um, experiencing a, uh, uh, a, a lack of longevity, particularly in what we call midlife um, uh, mortality. So midlife seems to be a, an emerging area of concern and primarily because of the, of the habits uh, and lifestyle habits that we have. For example, uh, we look at the opioid crisis. Um, we look at uh, substance abuse, smoking. These are lifestyle habits that, that tend to um, uh, cause us to pick up diseases much earlier in life. And we're seeing this with respect to uh, midlife mortality as well. Uh, we look at children. Uh, we have an entire section on children that look at uh, how their brains develop, particularly the architecture of the brain from bottom up towards the top of the brain and how we see uh, screen time and other stresses playing out with respect to uh, the, uh, that architecture and what happens in the brain when, when they're exposed to those stressors. We see, for example, childhood ADHD has risen about 800% in the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, bipolar diagnoses are about 4,000% higher in the last couple of decades. So that's another area of concern. Uh, we talk about happiness a lot, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more in the presentation as well. We look at things like, does, mo does money really buy happiness? And what, what is, uh, how do we define happiness? Because it's such a huge part of our lives. We see that about one third of all the employees um, in the, the research in the United States uh, describe themselves as experiencing very high stress. So we see massive, uh, what we call presenteeism. Um, and the workplace so that you're there physically, but you're not necessarily there mentally or emotionally as well. And the, uh, uh, the research on that is that you can be up to about $150 billion a year in losses um, in the United States alone because of presenteeism as well. Uh, why do we ignore sleep? That's another section that we talk about. About one third of, the, of us are chronically sleep deprived. And we did this very interesting overlay in the United States. We looked at different states um, and found that if you looked at chronic sleep deprivation in certain states, these were also the same states where we had the highest stress levels. Uh, we had the highest obesity levels. Um, we had the poorest nutrition as well. So it was a very, very interesting to be able to overlay those and, and discuss those uh, in the book as well. Um, finally, we looked at, uh, are we hardwired for risk? And we had an entire section, which was just fascinating looking at, at how we make decisions, uh, the leadership aspects, uh, the interpersonal relations, and are we, are we, are we hardwired to make risk judgments? Uh, one of the uh, fascinating cases that we looked at was um, the case of Sweden uh, switching from left driving lanes to right driving lane in 1967. And the expectation that that would lead to uh, unprecedented, you know, carnage on the roads with all of these traffic accidents happening. Um, but the, actually the opposite ended up happening because 
there's a risk happy place, a, a type of um, risk homeostasis that we that we tend to enjoy. And if we perceive <clears throat> that the risk is getting too high, um, then we adjust our behavior. Uh, also with uh, hand washing in hospitals, we see the same thing. And uh, um, Louis is gonna touch on that in just a moment, a bit more, but we see that uh, uh, you know, in the United States, for example, there are 75,000 deaths a year from preventable um, hospital uh, acquired infections um, attributed to hand washing alone. So again, this, this is a, a behavior aspect. Um, these are risk judgments that we, that we talk quite a bit about. But that's just the kind of the overview of the, of the kinds of themes that the book talks about. Obviously, we go in quite a bit more depth and the book is very well researched as well, where we look at uh, many cases and cite that research as well. Uh, but I'm gonna pass it over to, uh, to Louis again um, to uh, pick up on the, uh, the idea of hospitals and some of the error that happens within hospitals. Great, thanks Rob. Uh, Ismail, do you have the uh, results from where people are joining us from this evening? So the Middle East, Europe, North America, Africa, Asia, and elsewhere. Okay, well, we've got a good spread of people from all over the world. So we're gonna to look to you for your wisdom as well um, over the course of the evening. As Rob mentioned, we start the book off by talking, uh, you can take it down as well. We, we start the book by talking about um, hospitals and how dangerous hospitals are. Um, as someone who works in an acute care inner city hospital, I can tell you that I don't go to work uh, thinking I'm gonna hurt someone or planning to hurt someone, but hospitals are very complex systems uh, that have humans in them. So in spite of all the technology, in spite of all the pharmaceuticals, in spite of all the systems we have in place, um, it's still some place that you would rather not be. I've yet to meet a patient that actually wants to be a patient. So in the 30 years plus that I've been working in medicine, I've never met a patient that wanted to be a patient. So when I had the opportunity many years ago to, uh, to visit Muscat, Oman, and uh, participate in their visioning exercise of where they wanted uh, the health of uh, Omanians to be um, in, I think it was 2050, you know, I, I, I gave a provocative talk was um, how to improve the health of the nation, get rid of the patient. And so we know that there's three risk factors, smoking, inactivity, and poor nutrition that contribute to four major diseases, certain cancers, diabetes, cardiovascular illness, and pulmonary conditions. And that accounts for 50, 50% of all the disease burden out there is, it attrib is attributable to three risk factors. And that's where we started thinking, well, why do people do things? And similarly, when we do talks in industry, especially oil and gas, um, there's something called procedural intentional non-compliance. That's procedural intentional non-compliance. Uh, basically, you can translate that into why do smart people do dumb things? And so there's gotta be something that's driving us as humans that are making us do things that we know are inherently wrong for us. So we've gotta be hardwired because the fact that we're seeing the same diseases repeat themselves all over the world means that it's something to do with humans. And so that's what we're gonna try and talk in the, in the remaining part of this presentation about is why do humans do what humans do? We're, we've been hardwired to survive and there's this dopamine reward system. So your body actually rewards you when you find water. Your body actually rewards you when you find morsels of food. And your body really rewards you when you procreate, when you have sex, so that we survive as a species. Could these drivers be some of the reasons why we find that we have to have healthcare systems that in some countries consume 50% of their budget, and yet the results at the end of the day are not what one would expect. And that's why till healthcare systems and hospitals especially start taking patient safety as seriously as the oil and gas takes safety or the aviation industry takes safety, we're not gonna see the gains that we need to see. So if, if you work in healthcare, uh, you should stop and say to yourself, well, if what Robert and Louis is saying is true, then how can we continue harming our patients? 
Now we don't harm our patients intentionally, but the systems, because they really don't have much accountability and they don't have much measurement, um, aren't able to find areas to improve. You know, if I wanted to get a package to um, the UAE from Canada, I would call FedEx and FedEx would pick up that package and track it from the moment it's picked up to the moment that it's delivered and tell me the performance of the delivery schedule. We can't do that for patients because we don't track it, we don't have the systems and we don't have the willpower um, to try and make a difference at the end of the day. So if you work in healthcare, your job should be to go to work and try and figure out a way to shut down your hospital, to close beds, to unfortunately redirect staff to do other things that at the end of the day are gonna have far more impact on someone's health than building another hospital. If you think you're gonna make people healthier by building another hospital, that model has been shown not to work. And unfortunately, we see a lot of countries that are spending a lot of money trying to build systems that they see in the Europe and the UK and North America. I can tell you those systems are not working very well. So if we're gonna learn from an industry that takes safety seriously, uh, there's no better industry than the uh, aviation industry. And uh, Robert, as an airline pilot with 15,000 hours of experience, uh, you know, it's over to you, Captain. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, thank you, Louis. Um, and uh, yeah, Louis, right, we've, uh, we spent a lot of time looking at the safety realm. Uh, that is made up a bulk of our work, um, both healthcare uh, safety, so to speak, um, and then other industries as well. Because really, that is that. There's where a lot of big investigations are as to what went wrong, um, how can we improve, um, how can we make sure this never happens again. Uh, certainly, the the industry that seems to be leading the charge with respect to how can we make sure these kinds of things never happen again is the aerospace industry. Um, it is a high reliability organization. Um, constantly, constantly trying to improve, bring those error rates down. And so really there is a, there's no, um, there's no room for um, trying to, you know, guess what went wrong with respect to, um, you know, the mechanical side of things when there are bigger things at play. And the bigger things at play, um, which was discovered in the last you know, 20 years or so, is that the bulk of errors um, that lead to uh, incidents are of the human nature. Uh, so. We think of you know okay human error, uh, but there's more to it than just human error. There's it's not just an under, uh, a misunderstanding perhaps of how the you know the mechanical side of things worked, or perhaps missing something. Um, really, this gets into the domain of of uh, leadership, uh, decision making, how people work together effectively in teams, how we use all the resources to make the best decisions possible. And really, a lot of it comes down to what we call psychological safety. So the ability to, to speak up as a team member as well. And I can tell you, it goes both ways. So for example, from a medical perspective, when I was involved in bringing the operating room checklist into Canada, I was on the committee that, that helped do that. There was some pushback from some of the surgeons as well because they thought that uh, you know, it might be eroding some of their um, leadership or their ability to you know, make decisions um, in the operating room. Well, we you know, want to quickly put that to rest, those concerns to rest, because that psychological safety aspect not only applies to the person who is um, um, at a lower ranking team member position, but also the senior uh, leaders of the team as well, so that they can have confidence that what we're really talking about is them being allowed to make the very best decisions possible by others providing them with information to do so. So we, we have this social dynamic that now is the essentially the, the, at the forefront of aviation safety, looking at the social side of things. Um, and we've seen this play out in you know, other areas as well where decision-making was uh, encumbered or hampered by some of the uh, lack of willingness to speak up. One, of course, was the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster as well, where there was a sense that um, there wasn't necessarily a willingness to speak up. And those that did speak up, um, their voices weren't quite loud enough um, against the, uh, those who thought that the Challenger should fly that fateful day. Uh, so 
that ability to to speak up to have that psychological safety is is something that we're working for in aviation and it's also in healthcare as, as well so what is it about that social dynamic well as louis mentioned our brains are really hardwired for reward so we you know the simple one is okay well we're hardwired for say sugar and fat sure evolutionary drives for sugar and fat we would hunt all day for a carrot and now if you get a slushy at the corner store, it's about 30 teaspoons of sugar in that slushy as well. So our brains are becoming quickly oversaturated um, with all this reward. And that is, is, is at the crux of it where we are having our uh, health implications uh, that are playing out as well. But the social reward, that's another uh, theme that we spend a great deal of time discussing because that is again, the friction point between our social world and our health outcomes. So the social dynamic, Louis mentioned dopamine, the dopamine hit. So we pull out our, our phones from our pocket and we get a dopamine hit. Uh, we also get oxytocin, which is that cuddle hormone between a, you know, a mother and a newborn baby. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the hormone that's released uh, when you have you know, long duration, true love between spouses as well. It's that sort of, that, that, that feel, that warm feeling that you have that oxytocin release as well. So we spend a great deal of time looking at, well, what is it that gives us the social rewards that our brains feed off of, but then that has a detrimental effect. And, I'm, and social media ended up being at the, one of the top of our lists as well, particularly looking at uh, adolescents. So the adolescents have a period of their lives where their peer influence is uh, as much higher weight of, for their decision-making than anything else. So they will do things to get those likes on social media. They'll do things to get that peer acceptance. And we see very, very heavy social media use and having detrimental effects. So not only are we getting the, you know, the positive hit, that dopamine and the oxytocin, but long-term we're seeing uh, heavy social media use uh, linked to depression and other problems um, that Louis will talk about in a minute as well. We also see actual changes in the brain from heavy social media users as well, where they actually, the, the, the plasticity of the brain uh, and the structures are actually changing, um, particularly in the emotional parts of the brain. So uh, heavy social media use can often create a, a more emotional uh, response in individuals over time as well. So that's the, you know, takes away from some of that resilience that we have. So, but the ability to, to push ourselves away from social media and our phone is, is very, very difficult. We are, this is an intoxicatingly rich uh, stimulus environment with the social media in our phones. So about 95% of us will look at our phones before we fall falling asleep, which obviously has an effect on our um, melatonin, but it also has an effect on the way that we um, uh, interact. So social media makes us feel a certain way, particularly for, for adults. Uh, whether we start to compare ourselves to others. So this also inhibits our, our sleep as well. And about 90% of young people will actually sleep with their phones right beside them. And about one in five of them will wake up throughout the night as well to check their social media feeds as well. So their brains are constantly active and this is having some big significant health, uh, health implications. Uh, so I think I'll pass it over to, uh, to Louis again. Um, and we'll look at how some of these things play out in our uh, everyday lives and some of the ramifications of those from a health perspective. Okay. Well, Robert, uh, just checking in with time, it's um, half through. Um, I'm hoping people are enjoying this. I'm hoping we're not going too fast. Um, the question and answer is open for you. If you want to ask a question at any time, just uh, send it in. But we're going to do another quick little poll. If uh, Ismail, you can bring up this poll. Very simple question. I'm just going to ask you to think about this for a second. Are you lonely? Uh, the answers are yes, all the time, more often than I would like. No, I am very lonely. Uh, oh, no, that should say no, I am not lonely. Okay. So are you lonely? Yes, all the time, uh, more often, or no, you're not lonely. Sorry about that typo. So you take a second and answer that. And uh, while you're doing that, I'll just continue and, and tell you why this section is so important. I mean, if loneliness wasn't um, bad for us, you would have to ask yourself, why in the UK do they have a minister of loneliness? Uh, if happiness wasn't important for us, 
why? And then last time I checked, the UAE had a minister of happiness. So happiness and loneliness, anxiety, stress. And the World Health Organization tells us that depression, depression is now the leading cause of disability worldwide. So when you take a look at all these things together, you can easily see why suicide rates are up in the United States. Uh, there's been a 35% increase in suicide rates amongst young people. If I was to ask you, how many of you know someone who's either committed suicide or attempted suicide, I would suspect that the majority of your hands would go up. It's a topic that we don't like to talk about. It's a topic that is still very taboo. Um, mental illness is something that we should rebrand as brain health. Maybe it would uh, make it easier for us all to talk about it. But this is one area that we have to stop and say, wait a second, there's so many great things going on today, but there's also so many very sad things going on today. Can we figure out what's causing this sadness within our society and turn it around? Well, we know that social determinants of health have a lot to do with it. Uh, we know that how you were raised as a child has a lot to do with it. You've probably heard of adverse childhood events. Uh, ACE, adverse childhood events, are bad things that happen to young kids. And those consequences are carried through for the rest of the life of that young individual. And uh, if you're past a certain stage, 18 to 24 months, um, you can't recover from them. We know from studies that women that are pregnant that are undergoing stress um, have this condition that goes on in them where the stress is actually impacting on the DNA structure of the fetus, epigenesis. And the DNA structure on the fetus is actually changed. And that could be passed on from generation to generation. So we know that we're in a time when we have to look at um, these conditions that are new and emerging and emerging rapidly with a different set of lenses and a different set of um, solutions to them. You know, the first public health revolution was around infectious diseases and we responded by immunization and curative medicine and prevention. You know, the second public health revolution was around chronic diseases and we responded or tried to respond appropriately for that one. But I think we're heading into the third public health revolution where the things that are gonna have the greatest impact on our health are things that uh, are happening to individuals as a lack of social cohesion, as a lack of the ability to reach out and uh, touch someone and feel someone and see the empathy that someone gives towards. And with regards to happiness, I'm just gonna give you one little tip right now that um, if you wanna improve your happiness by 40%, all you have to do is volunteer. Happiness is 50% genetic. You either have it or you don't. There's not much you can do about that. You can get happier by about 10% with more money, but you can get about 40% happier through volunteering. The simple act of volunteering and doing it for the right reason will turn around and have a very positive impact on you. Isma, what's the uh, answer to our question? Ismail, if you can post the uh, answers. Mm. Okay, so what we have is <clears throat> a lot of people that are responding that they're quite happy. Now, what we can do, we can take that down. <clears throat> One of the answers to that, <clears throat> and we'll come back to it is, I wonder if there's any correlation with the fact that you're mostly, if you're gonna be on this uh, call, probably well-educated. You probably had a very good social upbringing you probably have the means and the resources to be in some sense of control over your life. And you should probably ask yourself, I wonder if that directly correlates to the fact that maybe it has something to do with you being lonely or not being lonely. These are the drivers that we have to try and instill in our public policymakers on a macro level, the importance of social connection, the importance of the social determinants of health, the importance of equality, the lack of discrimination, the lack of racism, the lack of sexism. These are things that, you know, aren't all that I know interesting for a lot of people, but at the end of the day, they probably have far greater impact on your health 
than adding another ICU or another doctor or another nurse or another pill. So if we you know, want to start getting into uh, some specifics, uh, we're gonna have to have a conversation on um, willpower and on happiness. And I turn it over to Rob to, um, to go in that direction. Uh, all right, thanks, Louis. Um, do you have time for a question? There was a question that came up, um, whether we are primarily focusing on health or whether we should consider this as well-being. Uh, how would you make the <clears throat> distinction uh, there? Well, I think that uh, we focus on well-being. I think for far too long, we've tried to focus on health. Uh, the social uh, determinants are something that aren't very well taught in school. Uh, but if you have someone that's brought up with all the social determinants of health adhered to, if you have someone that uh, fills all of Maslow's hierarchy, then what you'll do is you'll have someone that's um, in fairly good health. Uh, so I would say focus on the well-being because it's something within our realm and to start advocating and having those conversations. Uh, another person asked if the recording is gonna be posted for viewing. Yes, we're gonna do that. Um, I keep trying to recover from a past trauma. I've tried several things. Any advice on how to approach this step? Yes. So for those of you, as I mentioned, that uh, may have gone through past trauma, um, this, is, this is something that is incredibly difficult, as you know, as you've uh, struggled with this. Uh, some people are able to uh, move on. Some people are not able to move on. If you find that it's something that's consuming an, an enormous amount of your time, you're thinking about it, you're having trouble sleeping about it, it's affecting your relationships, it's having an impact on your friendships, then you should seek professional attention, whether it's through a, you know, a primary caregiver or whether you need a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Uh, don't neglect it, all right? Don't neglect it because it's not going to get better on its own. So Rob, over to you, and then we'll come back to some of these great questions. Yeah, great, thanks. So Louis left off on the on the question of, of willpower, and that's something that came up quite a bit um, during the course of our research, um, putting together the book. If we have this built-in hardwiring that is informing our decisions, but it's manifest as lifestyle behaviors, perhaps, then isn't it just a question of, of ramping up our willpower to be able to deal with it? So we looked a lot at willpower. Uh, we consulted a lot of the literature, uh, actually had some email discussions with some of the uh, foremost um, scholars in willpower as well. And the general consensus from some of the research and the experiments that are done as well, um, for example, the cookie and radish experiment, you can look that one up, it's fascinating as well. Um, the, the consensus is that willpower is a resource that we have that is, can be finite. In other words, like gas in, it's like gas in your car. You can fill your tank up, you can run your car, but eventually you've got to refill it up again uh, in some way to keep, to keep driving. And willpower is much the same. So one of the areas that I have uh, direct experience in is uh, athletics as well. Uh, so that's a, that's a fascinating area because the, the athletes are perhaps the most I mean, they're most disciplined people on the on the planet in terms of their their willpower to go and, and push through at extraordinary levels of you know physical um, uh, pain, essentially, to be able to train and compete. And so they have to be able to have this incredible willpower that they use every single day. Um, but what I observed at the time, and what makes perhaps more sense now after having researched it, is that you need this, this downtime. You have to give yourself um, the ability to refill that gas tank of willpower in your car by taking tactical uh, breaks from the willpower, allowing yourself um, you know, positive indulgences that you know, feed that same hardwiring. So you're not denying yourself um, this, uh, this hardwiring. You're not trying to shut off the hardwiring. You're trying to, again, feed it in a more positive way. So spending time with family, taking walks outside. Um, a lot of the athletes would, you know, uh, just relax, um, you know, read books, watch movies, do something that uh, allows you to replenish that, that tank. So that's one thing that we learned about willpower. And I think it's something that uh, we'll learn more and more about um, because it's how to, you know, get around this, how to deal with, with, these, uh, um, with this hardwiring that we have to live with. And one of the areas that we also looked at was was happiness. Now, Louis uh, touched on happiness before, but I want to look at it from the, the, the social side of it as well. 
So we looked at happiness as life satisfaction. Uh, we found that life satisfaction, as Louis mentioned, you need basic things in your life to have life satisfaction. You need a roof over your head. You have to have some sort of um, level of, of monetary income or at least have the ability to you know, put food on your table um, and look after your family. These are, these are a basic standard for, for life satisfaction. But beyond that, uh, we start getting into the really the, uh, the realm of enjoyment of life. Um, how much do you in, enjoy things? And what we found is that the social aspect of this is incredibly powerful. So uh, happiness and life satisfaction are not always measured by, by absolute wealth. We have, again, because of our hardwiring social dynamics, uh, we tend to compare ourselves a lot to others. Um, and social media, of course, is social media is the uh, biggest uh, arena for us doing this as well. So it's not necessarily the absolute wealth, but it's the relative wealth. About twice as many of us tend to compare ourselves to those who um, either have wealthier lives, perhaps who do more exciting things. Uh, and that's just a, a, a part of our hardwiring, our social dynamic, we, this social comparison comparing ourselves to others. But what happens then if we are constantly comparing ourselves to others um, who we may deem as having you know, more success or more, more goodies in their lives or maybe living a better life in some capacity? If we do that all the time, then we, we tend to start having a perpetual unhappiness with our current state as well. So we looked at happiness uh, from a country to country perspective and looked at the countries that are our happiest uh, and found that the places and the countries that are that tend to be happiest have the ability to somehow move around this idea of comparing themselves to others who may have more. They have a, a more egalitarian culture. Uh, they are able to look after each other and have stronger social networks that tend to level out that hierarchy of the haves and have nots. So that is a, it's a very, very important message. It, it, it can start with you though. It can start with the ability, the idea that, you know, of consciously not trying to compare yourself to others, trying to live in more in the, in the moment and trying to enjoy the things that you have as well. Um, there's some fascinating studies in the book that talk about this, that look at social comparison, particularly with uh, adolescents. Uh, one fascinating study in Fiji, looked at young girls uh, in Fiji in the mid 1990s. Um, it was done by an anthropologist uh, where some of the um, habits of the young girls were to enjoy life um, in the social dynamics of their family. And when they introduced television um, and particularly certain American shows that portrayed young um, girls and young women as um, having you know, these great lives and you know, looking a certain way, then the young girls uh, started to have uh, dietary issues um, such as purging. And, not, and it wasn't just a small problem, it became an enormous problem as well. So that the idea of com constantly comparing yourself um, to others uh, has some serious health consequences. And we're seeing this now uh, throughout the social media as well and the effects of that. And we discuss that quite a bit uh, in the book as well. Robert, um, yeah. in the interest of time, we've got 15 minutes left and we've got about 15 questions. Uh, yeah. I'd like to uh, see if we can just switch into answering as many of those as possible. Yeah, I'll pull them and up. Then, and then that way we can cover the remaining material we were going to cover as well. So uh, the first one from Asma uh, uh, is, I think, right up your alley. It's, uh, I don't think the comparison between the healthcare sector and the aviation sector is a fair one. Uh, in the healthcare sector, most of the decisions are are personal while it says, you know, in aviation, they're automated. Uh, I keep hearing comparison, but I don't think um, they're similar to compare in the first place. Do you want to comment on yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so good question, good question. Um, so there are levels of redundancy perhaps that are built in, which means that there are um, uh, automation of say the aircraft is um, one area, uh, one level of safety perhaps, but what we're finding is that um, when you look at things that have gone wrong, uh, those tend not to be the problem for the most part. Um, what tends to be the problem is the social dynamic. Um, 
the interaction of the of the human uh, with human. Uh, so the team environment, the decision making. So although there is that amazing level of automation that happens um, in an aircraft and other industries perhaps that have you know similar levels of automation, nuclear, and perhaps some aspects of medicine as well, uh, the the domain that is the big question mark that still yields the most errors is that human element, and that's where the focus is is on and. When we look at the healthcare industry as well, that's clearly uh, where the most work needs to be done, but it's also equally evident in, in aviation. These are learning, learning organizations, the high reliability organizations. These are where they end up looking at all the near misses that happen. Um, they look at all the threats that, that can lead to problems. And they find that much of this um, can be mitigated in that human domain as well. And that includes aviation. So, um... I'm finding this is the best part of the presentation, uh, having your questions and trying to answer them. And I remember when I did my PhD, uh, they kept asking questions and they kept ask, asking questions till I was comfortable saying, I don't know the answer. So mm -hmm. I've learned that a long time ago. So if I don't know the answer to some of your great questions, I'll just tell you. But if you email us, we'll send you our email, we'll post our emails at the end of the presentation. We'll try and get back to you as well. Um, there was one from Anonymous that says, what about the data showing that there were fewer deaths when doctors were not readily available? Well, that's absolutely true. I know that uh, when doctors go on strike in various parts of the world and you take a look at the data afterwards, there is less deaths. And the reason for that is if you don't interact with the healthcare system, chances are you're not gonna uh, you know, receive a, an error unintentionally. So you're absolutely correct on that. Another one says, you seem to indicate that not being lonely means happiness. Aren't they different things, Rob? Uh, yeah. So I mean, not being lonely um, means happiness. Uh, let me read the question. You seem to indicate that to not being lonely means happiness. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, you can be unhappy or happy, um, irrespective of whether you are uh, lonely or not. So um, they are quite different things. Um, what we're saying is that um, from the research we found, um, and we do have a separate section on happiness. Um, when we talk about loneliness, um, I think that a lot of that came out of certainly the research um, around social media about the way that we communicate now, uh, the fact that even though we have this so-called uh, social media, uh, the use of it is, is uh, also leading to increased uh, loneliness. And as <clears throat> Louis mentioned, um, that recognition of loneliness is certainly making it into policy with, uh, Louis mentioned the UK Minister of Loneliness um, as um, having serious consequences. There are health consequences and, uh, you know, being lonely, for example, um, has real health consequences to the, to the magnitude of, you know, smoking a half a pack of cigarettes a day. Um, so uh, that, that type of loneliness we looked at in the book as being directly linked to um, actual physical, physiological health consequences as well. The happiness side, I think that we, what we found was that um, that ended up being a, a very interesting adventure looking at what happiness is, particularly looking at the, the health outcomes and how that the social dynamics uh, fed into that as well. So yeah, they are separate things, um, uh, but I think it's, uh, they are most certainly related. So um, another one, I'm going to give Yusuf uh, a heads up. Yusuf, you've asked and you made some very good points. Um, if you would feel comfortable uh, to uh, just turn on your mic and video and in a few minutes, maybe just sort of articulate that because uh, there's a lot of uh, really interesting things in there. Ennis uh, Bendak asked about uh, what are your thoughts on Dunbar's number? Mm. Um, I don't know much yeah. about Dunbar's number. I remember it basically somebody said that you need about 150 individuals yes. in your life. Um, now, we know from the Rosetta effect and other effects that uh, the more people that are meaningful in your life on a daily interactive basis um, will have a positive impact. Now, I know that sometimes family dynamics are terrible, but if you're having positive people around your life supporting you, then um, I, I think the number is arbitrary. I've heard numbers that it takes uh, 40 individuals to raise a child properly, sort of the extended family. And there's an African saying on that as well. But uh, yeah, uh, Dunbar's number, 
I don't know. I mean, just stop and ask yourself, uh, do you know your neighbors? Uh, do you know people around you where you live? Um, that would be a great place to start by introducing yourself to neighbors and letting your neighbors know that you're there to support them in whatever way you possibly can. Yeah. I'm currently in quarantine in Nova Scotia. And if it wasn't for the kindness of our neighbors feeding us, uh, you know, there's not enough things in the garden to survive on. So I know the importance of social connection. Yusuf, I see you're um, turned on. Are you ready to ask your question? Yes, I am. Go ahead, Yusuf. Okay. Thank you so much for, for letting me in, actually, in this uh, inspiring presentation, as usual. Uh, the, third, the first question is actually is about uh, a trend in futuristic studies, which basically talks about smaller communities for control, for looking more into the social determinants of health. And I think uh, it's, it's a theme probably you have mentioned in the book. I haven't read the book yet. But uh, it's something I've been calling for, and uh, Dr. Francis Scott knows that very well. Smaller community are easier to control, easier to, to be more cohesive. And actually, in some parts of the world, this structure still exists. So, so the, the Ministry of Loneliness or, 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 or sort of will not be needed if we really pay attention early enough to stop what you have just called uh, third public health crisis related to loneliness. Unfortunately, what's happening in many parts of the world, we're still living the era of, of, of trying to, 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 to catch the industrial revolution, although we have seen the ugly face of industrial revolution. And, and uh, it's to our communities here, they are, they are just agricultural communities that saw the results of, of the industrial revolution. And, and, and yet we are still Walking, walking the same old paths that people have, have, have shown that it did not work very well. So it's just uh, when I pose the question is basically if there is a model that you explored during, during, during writing the book that will advise communities at different level of, of development to, to, to catch on certain things so they don't go the same, the same, the same, the same, uh, the same, the same path that other communities went through and, and to the extent that they, they, they really, uh, the, whole, the whole thing of, of breaking down the community and the smaller community has led to, to, to more of, of, of burden on healthcare system, on the, social, uh, on the social systems and so on. That was the essence of my question. Okay, so Yusuf, I'll, I'll answer that uh, while Robert uh, goes through the rest of the questions and sees if there's uh, patterns to them and we'll, we wanna try and get to as many as uh, possible. But Yusuf, there is a, a country, Denmark, that has done this and done it very well. Denmark has not opened a long-term care facility in over 25 years. Denmark is every day closing acute care facilities by providing communities the opportunity to age in place. So seniors are provided support in their home up to 24 hours a day and provided housing that they can adapt to. So as they get older, they need less housing, they move into smaller housing, but it's all done within the framework of a community. And so you're absolutely right. The trend is to go towards smaller communities and this is where Dunbar's number becomes important. If you know everybody within your community and you feel that they're part of your community, then you get that sense of safety, you get that sense of um, you know, comfort, you get that sense of support, you get that sense of independence, you get the sense of wanting to volunteer to help others. And it becomes a sort of a self-perpetuating cycle as well. So you, you're absolutely correct. I think we need to start talking about the fact that we're in the third public health revolution. Um, and once we acknowledge that, then we can start looking for concepts from around the world and share, sharing them with each other because uh, no one place has it all. We have to take the best of different places and share with each other and put them together. So I'm very glad you brought that up. Robert, did you uh, yeah. pick up on any trends? We have uh, six minutes left. Yeah, I think I'm gonna combine a couple of them here because they're very similar and I think it's an important point. Um, so there's some questions that, dis that talk about the pressure that uh, people feel in our current society and communi community and always have to maintain a certain image and keep up with others. And it's very stressful. And if you feel like you don't do this, um, you'll disappoint your family. And how do I begin uh, to navigate this? 
And I think there's also another question that's very similar too about in our modern life, um, how do we normalize the, the idea of, of that you have this inevitability like a machine um, that we have to, to get around as well. So how do we navigate um, the stress that we feel? And I think that, uh, I think inherently we, we, we do sense this. And I think this is an important part of the book is that, is that uh, inherently we do feel that um, our world is changing and that there is a, a type of stress that's associated with this. And as Louis has pointed out, this stress manifests um, in real phys physical and in health issues. And it's only when we begin to look at that social aspect and how, and how change is happening. In fact, we make the, we make the argument that, that, um, that our, our health will now be determined more so by our social world than, than anything else. So how do we, how do we navigate this, this stress? And Louis might have some ideas as well, but I think just what Louis was saying as well is that we have to look at some of the evidence and some of the evidence and some of the examples of, of where we have been able to make some successes. And this is in the, in the domain of, of networks, community networks, family networks, so that you feel that you have that social support. And once again, we feel that when we have that level of support from our colleagues, our family or our social networks or community networks, we know that they have our back. We do feel better about that. Um, and I think our outlook uh, becomes more positive as well. Um, Louis, did you wanna add anything to round out that answer? Yeah, no, I, uh, I'm just really excited by the, the depth of the questions because people like the last one, uh, will trying to limit the size of the community lead to social exclusion. Um, that's excellent. You know, as you're starting to think of possible solutions, you're you're thinking of uh, side effects as well. You know, when when we started this um, book, we were wondering, you know, why are things the way they are? And uh, we're convinced that uh, humans are being asked to do impossible things with software that doesn't work. And so it's going to be very difficult for humans to catch up to the 21st environment because the 21st environment is going to be the 21st century is going to be rapidly changing with artificial intelligence and everything that's coming before us. We're playing catch up. And so I don't think we can ever expect to wait from an evolutionary perspective that we're going to catch up because the world is just changing too rapidly. So what we hoped to capture in this book by the title Hardwired is to get people to think very differently because, you know, complex problems, uh, don't have simple solutions. And we, we're always trying to find simple solutions for very complex problems. Um, obviously, you know, we've got uh, two minutes left and I'd like our host to have the final words, but Rob and I, especially with Zoom, it's so easy to continue this conversation with anyone. If you're teaching a class and you'd like us to join your class, or if you have a, an association, or if you've got a, a ministry, wherever. I mean, Rob and I can make ourselves available to have a conversation and continue this conversation with you. And we learn so much from your questions. So this is a, a learning exercise for us as well. And it keeps our brain sharp. And uh, we're just so excited to, um, to meet all you new friends and, uh, you know, to be able to share virtually around the world some ideas. And uh, hopefully collectively, we can put our best thoughts forward and make a difference at the end of the day. So uh, I'd like to turn it over to our host and uh, to those that sent us questions, uh, we'll give you our email address. We can continue this conversation, uh, but I think we got a really good uh, cross section of questions in and uh, hopefully this has been of help to you. It's definitely been of uh, help to Rob and I. Uh, so thank you so much. It was incredible really session and uh, I think we could stay even like another hour. So maybe it is like pity that we had only one hour. So. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Robert. It was really excellent uh, presentation. It was very thoughts provoking. Uh, I would like also to thank all to, uh, those who were helping to arrange this webinar. It is like management of our college and UA University uh, who gave us green light and supported organization of this webinar. The organizational and technical team, uh, Mr. Al Sajir, Ismail Al Konaisi, Dr. Ifat Al Barazi, and uh, Ms. Shams Al Shamsi. Uh, of course, thank you all of you uh, who participated today uh, for your interesting questions. So I think it was really very exciting. 
uh, our next webinar will be on November 18th, and it will be a um, topic will be fake news and public health. So it could, could be very interesting also. So please follow us on social media uh, to find more details. Uh, we look forward to see you next month. Uh, on the screen, you can see uh, emails uh, of our today's speaker, speakers and also their website. Uh, so you can really keep in touch with them. Uh, keep well. Stay safe and uh, goodbye. See you next time. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. bye, everybody.